Advanced Operating Systems 2020 Term 2 Week 4 Performance Measurement and Analysis. So today is one of my favorite fun lectures on performance evaluation and analysis. And um, you, you'll see why I think it's fun. At least it's fun for me. I hope it's fun for you. Systems is all about, as I said earlier, two things, performance and security. And we will deal with security later, although this has been sort of underlying a lot of what we do here in general. And performance means, OK, we want to get, have our systems perform well. And in order to get there, we need to understand performance. We need to measure and analyze it. And this is what today is about. So there, there's a number of questions you need to ask yourself when you look at performance. And uh, this is sort of what actually constitutes good performance. Is there something like an absolute measure or an accepted standard for performance? And um, or what, what kind of baseline you take because performance has really something absolute. It's typically a comparison against some baseline. And the other aspect is um, what are you really comparing? Or oh, this is sort of part of that. Are you looking at best case, at average cases, or at worst case, or at an expected case? These are all four different things. And um, depending on what you want to achieve, you need to think about which one is the appropriate. And then there's, um, they, they relate to how you configure your evaluation. Typically, it's very easy to measure some hot cache performance where you run something in a loop and re reiterate the same operation many times. And that sort of gives you a reasonable approximation to the best case. But it's not necessarily the relevant case because if you run your operating system, for example, to support a web service or a database or both, then ideally you don't want to spend most of the time in the operating system, which means a lot of the stuff is done at user level and your operating system will not operate typically with hot caches and will, and therefore the best case uh, measurement is not necessarily the relevant one. So this is something to keep in mind. And in general, what we do for analyzing performance is benchmarking. And I'm not generally a fan of putting cartoons in my uh, slides, but uh, this is the one I can't resist because it's so appropriate. There's just a lot of bullshit going on with benchmarking. And um, I'll, I'll drill down on a fair amount of that in this uh, lecture. There's an old saying, there's lies, damn lies, and benchmarks. And um, as you'll see, there's definitely plenty around. And of course, the, the whole point of it is we want to do really serious, credible science and engineering. And therefore, we do not want to lie with benchmarks. We want to do honest performance assessments. And that means we sort of really need to understand what we're doing. And there's sort of a, li a list of considerations and I'll sort of drill down and some of those in detail and others are sort of just cover very shallowly. So whether you use micro or macro benchmarks, um, I'll talk about benchmark subsetting, um, completeness of results, significance of results, baselines, ethics, etc. These are all things where you can do things wrong and where people routinely do things wrong. And it really annoys me. And if um, I'm a reviewer of a paper and some of these things annoy me, then the paper is most likely doomed. And if, if you're doing, just doing your thesis, then the thesis is not necessarily doomed, but you lose marks. So there's a good incentive for um, understanding what you're doing. So one, one important thing to understand is when you do benchmarking, we do it for a reason. And typically is we did some research or engineering on a system presumably to improve something, right? You, you hardly, you generally don't mess around with the system just to not, not for any particular objective. You want to have some, some outcome, some improvement for the overall system from that. And then you need benchmark, you do, you benchmark the system afterwards in order to either show that 
if your objective was to improve performance that you have actually done it or if your objective was something else like security that at least you didn't destroy performance in the process and so there's these two aspects to benchmarking that or, or to performance that in general you want to satisfy these two criteria. The conservative one is not undermining performance and the progressive one, at least if performance improvement was the objective, showing that there's an actual improvement. So this is important, right? Just because you say um, you improved round trip latency, if this comes at the cost of um, massively improving the amount of data shipped, then that's not necessarily a gain. So, this is what I mean when I say you need to satisfy both criteria. So in, in the particular aspect where you want to improve things, you want to demonstrate that there is an improvement. And then in every other aspect, you'd at least like to get stay at the, the initial level, right, and not destroy things. So this is important to understand. And it's actually amazing how many people don't seem to get that, even people who are researchers writing papers and trying to get them published. And um, the other thing which I will emphasize over and over again is you really need to a, analyze what you see and not just taking a simple number blindly and really understand the, the results. And this understanding or explaining at least to yourself is quite key to avoiding really stupid errors. And I've seen that where people in a, in a paper, which some of them are published, some I stopped from publication when I was a reviewer, where they clearly under, didn't understand what they were doing. And they measured something, and um, the, the results didn't, didn't make sense. And they sort of really, they, they had a, a problem they didn't understand. They didn't understand their own results. And there were cases when I understood what was going wrong, and that doesn't, didn't help them get their paper published, obviously. So a real important aspect here is you need to have a, a model of your system and sort of in the, the typically experimental science terms this is an hypothesis of how your system develops and reacts to what you do to it and then you do experiments to effectively confirm the hypothesis or reject it so having having at least a mental model of the system you're dealing with is extremely important because that gives you sort of a guideline of where things should be heading and it in particular most importantly it gives you warning signals if things are going the wrong way right you, you have your model that tells you if i do this to the system then that should happen if something else happens then you know there's something wrong either your understanding of the system or you you did some implementation error or something like that okay so, and then there's the, the criteria, obviously, of objectiveness and fairness that you j um, evaluate against a appropriate baseline and um, you don't cheat with uh, evaluating alternatives. Okay, so now let's dig in on some of the aspects that um, are relevant to benchmarking. One is micro benchmarks versus macro benchmarks. So a, a macro benchmark is ideally a full system evaluation. For example, a web server running a typical web workload. Whereas a micro benchmark is something that exercises a particular system operation. For example, system call overhead or IPC or network ping pong, something like that. Something that is a, const, uh, a component of an overall system, but that is not the, the full system itself. And both have their place. The micro benchmarks are the ones the end user really cares about. I don't care as if I use a, a service, I don't care about their network latency. I, want, I care about how quickly I get a result back. But micro benchmarks are valuable as an anal analysis tool. So they are, they are what allows you to drill down. If you have established an overall performance and maybe you're not happy with it, you think it could be better, then micro benchmarks are one way of really probing the system and understanding where the performance comes from and what limits it. So both have their place, but what you very often see is people just doing some micro benchmarks and that's done with it. Okay, we got a 50% improving improvement on this particular micro benchmark. For me as the end user, that means nothing, right? 
I want to see whether I get to see a real end-to-end -end improvement. So um, just doing micro benchmarks in general is not enough. They're really, as I said, they're an analysis tool rather than an overall evaluation thing. Another thing is standard versus ad hoc benchmarks. So there's a whole plethora of standard benchmarks around for measuring different things. So SPEC, for example, has been around for decades, uh, started off as basically a processor benchmark for uh, measuring CPU performance. And these days, they have web, and they have Java, and they have whatever. Um, Embassy is one more targeted at uh, embedded systems. YCSP is a cloud benchmark that's widely used. Um, this has a, a um, international nonprofit organization behind it. Embassy, I'm not sure how they work. They're fairly expensive if you have to fork out money for them. And YCSP is just an open source thing that's been created by Yahoo. So these things, they're really nice because they've generally been designed with a lot of thought behind. There's experts working on them. For example, SPEC, they have, dec as I said, decades of experience. They have people who really understand how to evaluate systems, etc. So they've done a lot of work for you in establishing sort of what you should be looking at. And in particular, they come in suites that try to probe different aspects of an overall system. And then the whole suite together gives you a useful measure of performance. So that's why they're, they're really good. And therefore, you should be using them whenever you can. But sometimes you can't. For example, you do something where there is no established um, uh, benchmark, standard benchmark, which happens occasionally. Or more likely, um, you're unlikely to be able to run YCSP on your SOS system, right? Because it doesn't have the functionalities. Uh, this expects um, comp a real file system, real network, uh, POSIX environment, etc., which you haven't got. So if you want to evaluate um, the performance of your SOS system, then you need to obviously do some more ad hoc things and you will probably rely on micro benchmarks a lot. But in the end, you probably want to see sort of a bit of uh, actual systems uh, performance. For example, in your little shell, what does it take to load a process and um, execute it compared to, say, on Linux? So uh, th the main drawback is, yes, you lose com uh, comparison in general. In this case, for your SOS system, that's not too bad because we have our internal established um, performance baselines. And you com you, what you do is comparable to the rest of the class, etc. So it's not too bad. But in general, if you do some serious systems work, um, that's really sort of a using non-standard benchmarks is just a measure of last resort, not something you will aim to do. OK, now an interesting question arises. As I said before, these standard benchmarks, they come in suites, which tend to consist of maybe half a dozen or dozens of individual programs. And then when you run these things, you are faced with a choice of people want to have a single unit of measure, a single figure of merit. Now, that's good for marketing, but it's also good for really comparing complex systems where performance is a complex interaction of different components um, in a way that you can say, well, this system, these two systems are roughly comparable, or the one is clearly faster than the other, etc. So you're faced with the question, if you have this set of, say, a dozen or so individual programs, and you want to derive a single m figure of merit, how do you do that? What you, would you think you would do? And we have this very simple example to prove the point here. We have two, three systems which we're comparing using a suite consisting of only two benchmarks. And in the end, we want a single figure of merit that says system X, system Y, or system Z is the best performing. How do you do that? I'm sure you've run in this situation before, so you must have some idea. Is there a weighted average or something? 
Okay, you take an average. Yeah, if you say weighted, what do you, would you weight it with? Yeah, that could be. Um, in general, these suites are sort of built on the assumption that they're all equally important. So your weight is one. Okay, so you take the average, right? Okay. Hmm? Harmonic mean. Harmonic mean. Why would you use the harmonic mean? Yes, why do we use the harmonic mean? Yeah, we intentionally bias the overall result by your worst performance, right? This is not necessary. This might be something you want in some cases here where you say, okay, if something does really b badly on, on some aspect, we penalize it, yeah. But um, it's not the typical situation you'd have here. Any other ideas? No, okay. Then let's look at the, the mean. So if we take the mean here, um, let's say smaller is better. So these are latencies. So system X on benchmark 1 has 20 seconds and benchmark 2, 40 seconds. So the average is 30. So system Y has 10 and 80, average is 45. System Z has 40 and 20, average is 30. So which system should you buy? Are X or Y according to this, right? Okay. Question is, is this a sound reasoning here? Or in other words, is the mean the right measure? Trying to answer this one is, these benchmarks, the absolute times typically don't matter, right? It's sort of how you perform against a, a baseline. Okay, so let's l take system X as the baseline. And ideally, it shouldn't really matter which system you use as the baseline, right? Because you're comparing systems and which, which is the best should not depend on which you use as the normal for, the, for normalizing. So let's normalize to system X, which is the same as saying we use system X as the baseline. So obviously the relative performance of system X is one because that's the baseline. The relative performance of system Y is 0.5 here and two here because it, this one it's twice as fast and this is half as fast. And system Z it's the other way around, right? And so which one would you buy now? System X is now suddenly the clear winner, right? Which is different from what we had before. So that's a bit odd. Just by looking at relative performance against the baseline, the overall picture changes. It's probably not what we want. Just to dig a bit deeper, let's normalize for, against system Y. And that should, you'd expect, that should really have the same ranking in the end. Turns out that now system Y is the fastest. So there's a, an interesting normalization advantage, right? This, uh, th there's only one takeaway from this one. The mean is a crap measure for doing this, right? Because it's very sensitive to normalization. That's not what we want. Unless the absolute performance mean figures really have some inherent meaning, which sometimes happen. So the basic rule is for relative numbers, the arithmetic mean is meaningless. What else could we use? You could try the harmonic mean. There's another thing that turns out is much better, which is the geometric mean. It's also easier to calculate. Um, so let's use the uh, geometric mean. So the geometric mean is Geometric mean of n numbers is the nth root of the product of these numbers. <clears throat> so we still normalize the system y. 10 times 80 is 800. Sorry, system y is we're looking at the relative performance. So it's one, obviously, the mean is one. Um, system x, it's 2 times 0.5 is 1. Square root of 1 is 1 z four times a quarter is one square root of that is one. Surprise, they all come out the same. 
Now let's go back normalizing against system X. And again, they come out the same. So this is an important property. The geometric mean is invariant under normalization. And therefore, it's a good measure. And in this particular case, it means, OK, it doesn't matter. They all, they all perform. Their, their mean performance is the same. But of course, they are quite different systems because they do. Obviously, this is a constructed case, right? But um, uh, you, you do see things like that, where a particular implementation does better on some bench, sub benchmarks than others, and a, a different one does is the other way around. This is, th the situation itself is not atypical at all. So the golden rule is, unless you have absolute numbers that actually have a meaning, the, the normal situation is you operate with relative numbers or normalized numbers. And in that case, the geometric mean is the figure of merit you should choose from. And if you look at how spec, for example, derives their figure of merit across the suite, they do exactly that. They use the geometric mean. OK, so this is an important thing to learn. And then by a related thing, while we are at benchmark suites, I see that a lot. We evaluate our performance using the spec benchmarks, and we show typical results. Now, if someone writes typical result in a paper, or whether it's a paper or it's a real estate ad or something like that, you can bet your bottom dollar that they cherry picked, right? They picked the best looking ones. Um, <clears throat> and of course, this is really bad. This, this undermines the integrity of the results if you cherry pick. You've got to show the whole suite. So because any subsetting introduces benchmarks, you saw that in the example before, uh, sorry, in, introduces bias. You saw that in the example before, right? Where over the whole suite, all three systems performed the same for the mean value for our figure of merit. If you had left one out, then the picture would radically change. And this is totally typical of these benchmarks. Spec CPU, for example, is intentionally a mixture of memory intensive versus CPU intensive programs because real world programs do both things, right? And if you just cherry pick some, then you bias the overall result because you, particularly if you pick the one that makes your implementation look best, chances are your implementation looks best on either of the extreme cases rather than the mix. So this is a very serious undermining of um, integrity of the results. So I classify that the benchmarking crime. Now, there is actually situations where you are forced to do some subsetting. And again, this is think of your SOS system. You don't have a complete POSIX environment. You have a very restricted operating system. You still want to measure its performance somehow. So you can't run all of spec. You could probably get a few of the spec programs up and running if you tried, um, but probably not the whole suite. So what do you do? Well, you have no choice in a way, right? You, you cannot run the whole suite, um, but at, at least you need to be open about it. You say, OK, these results inherently have limited um, validity because I just show you a subset. And don't pretend this is an actual performance figure of a realistic system. Um, a related one is not partial benchmarks, but partial data. And again, this is one I see a lot. So people do, for example, IO systems, networking in particular. And the thing you're interested in there is often um, throughput. So how many bytes can your network stack handle per second? And then say you have a network stack and you want to do an improved network stack that's more secure before, for example, you, you modularized it, right? You have you, you put different protocol le levels in different components, et cetera, to make the whole thing more robust. So a safety or security improvement. And then you want to sh show what has that done to performance. And you see, OK, latency is degraded by 10% which is totally 
reasonable, right? You, you, you add, you basically add six, um, process boundaries and therefore and crossing those costs, so you expect some performance degradation. That's fine. And 10% under those ex, uh, circumstances would actually look really good. You'd be pretty happy with uh, only having that introduced 10% overhead. What I claim here is this is complete bullshit when you say you're, when all you do is measuring throughput and it's 10% degraded, then to conclude that this is 10% overhead. Why? So the question is, if you, if you see a throughput degradation, where does that come from? What would actually, what could possibly degrade the, the throughput of your network stack? Compare these two possibilities, both, both um, resulting in 10% throughput degradation. The one system has a loaded CPU and throughput drops from 100 megabits to, to 90 megabits. So how would you describe this situation? Yeah, so the system is loaded and can't keep up with the load, right? So the, the throughput drops because you are CPU bound. Okay? What's this, the lower one? We start off with 100 megabits per second and 20% CPU load and drop 10% throughput but double the CPU load. There's still a lot of headspace in the CPU, right? So you're obviously not CPU limited here. So you presumably are latency limited somehow, right? Your processing latency of the packets uh, reduces the throughput. Would this be fairly described as 10% overhead? Who thinks this is fairly described as 10% overhead? One, why? <laughs> um, presumably, if you have CPU um, capacity remaining, but you still see a slowdown, that can be described as a problem. Yeah. yeah. Sure, but that's, I'm not interested in the slow button here. I said overhead, right? You more than double the CPU load. To me, that seems a bit more than 10% overhead introduced, right? <laughs> so this is basically more than two, an effect of two overhead. So that the proper figure of merit is how much does it cost to process a packet? Right? So you're looking at processing cost per unit data. And in the first case, that's 11 CPU microsecond per kilobyte, kilobit. And the other case, it's 4.4 microseconds per kilobit. Well, from 10 to 11, sorry. And the other case from 2 to 4.4. .4. So you get a massive increase of processing cost. And I would call the first one 10% overhead and the other 120% overhead. So selling this as 10% overhead is just dishonest or incompetent. The one is not much better than the other. So it, this is a classical benchmarking crime. Just look at throughput and from the throughput degradation calculate the overhead. That's just an incomplete picture. It may be true, but it may be vastly off. Right? It, you have incomplete data. You can't say, you can't complete, com conclude from this figure what the overhead is. Okay, so this is uh, one part of what not to do. Um, if we, of course, this is really this is easy to measure, right? You can it's easy to measure CPU load, and um, this is a sh something you should always be doing. Anything, any sort of operation that's where you look at latency of some sorts, you should always look at CPU load, and in many cases. Um, most of the benchmarks you run, they are CPU limited, and so you expect the CPU load to be 100%. You should just confirm that it actually is the case. If you run something like LM Bench, it's designed to be load up the CPU and uh, be CPU bound. With networks, you can't be sure because there's more things at play. 
Okay, now assume you have this problem where okay you expected to get some degradation but really you get you have massively more than you expected so instead of you actually have a doubling of cost more than that and you have no idea where this is coming from what do you do in general it's profiling right anyone used the profiler before very good. We were starting to use tools. I'm always really disheartened when out of the whole class only one or two put their hands up at this point. It's sort of um, what, what do they teach in first and second year. You can look at micro benchmarks as one particular way of doing profiling, right? But there's, a, there's more general profiling support available on systems, except of course not on yours because you don't have enough infrastructure. This is a problem when you deal inside the operating system and you're, you're debugging and performance analysis um, support is generally much reduced. But generally profiling is about um, collecting stats or, of a running system and in generally it's invasive because in order to get these performance data you need to somehow instrument the system and of course that interferes with the performance itself which means um, you have to be careful with not overemphasizing the profiling results. They, they're not replacement for benchmarking. You want for actual benchmarking, obviously you want to do on an uninstrumented system, which is sort of the, the production kind of system you're using. Whereas with uh, profile, profiling, there's some degree of, of uh, instrumentation always necessary in order to get to the data. So there's a trade-off here. Um, but the idea is if as long as the interference from the profiling itself is relatively small, then you get very re can get very useful data out of it about this performance of your system. Um, if you have a hardware debugger like a Lauterbach tool or um, something like that, they tend to be very expensive but extremely useful. So if you do systems development in particularly embedded systems, etc., in industry, then you would use these tools, and they have the advantage they they just um, run at CPU speed and use hardware interfaces to extract the data without affecting the performance of your system. But in general, you have to use software to means and then you get some interference. And of course, the idea is that use profiling to find out the bottlenecks and then focus on those. Um, and the standard tool in the Unix-ish world is GProf which is, it's been around as long as I've been using Unix, um, so th three and a half decades or something, and it wasn't particularly brand new then. This is sort of really, it's, it's as standard as the C compiler pretty much. And um, basically what it does is compiles trace point into the program and uses statistic sampling. So typically they have a, a timer that um, generates Time interrupts at random time points, and then they just check where's the program counter, record that, bin it somehow to make it efficient, and then keep running. And then there's some processing step, which collects all this data, matches this back to the code, and then you get some useful information out of it, like this stuff where um, you have, in this case, you see that the, the dominating function, which consumes the highest percentage of time, one third of the overall time, um, is open and it's called so many times. The individual time per call is actually tiny. So you can see, okay, this is prominent because it's invoked a lot, not because it's slow. And then there's other stuff and you can sort of um, try to understand the system behavior from that. And then it also has um, some way of drilling down so you can see the call tree, etc. And if something gets called a lot, you can see get, does it always mostly get called from the same place or get from different ones and so Very useful tool. Unfortunately, not usable inside the operating system. Um, ah. So, 
if you want to profile the OS, what do you use? In your OS, you have to do very low level. It's like printf debugging and yes, um, writing your own timer driver. If you do it in Linux, but fundamentally, the tool you use is the performance monitoring unit. So GProf is basically runs, works on pretty much any program because it's a pure compiler level thing, right? Um, the PMU is a hardware part, a part of your processor. And these days, PMUs are wonderful. They give you so many things that you can observe. And they are a really great tool for understanding performance. And this is something we can use even for optimizing SEO4 performance because um, we can use it on the kernel. And it doesn't require direct tool support because um, it's just a bunch of counters. So the way the PMU works is it allows you to um, monitor certain events. And I'll give you a sample list of events later. Uh, but there are things like, for example, um, TLB misses or cache misses or such things. And typically a CPU has a lot of those, can be hundreds. And then there's a bunch of counters and you basically can, the counters are very limited resources, there's only a, a handful or so. And the PMU allows you to bind a counter to a particular event. So you have a large set of events to choose from but a very limited set of counters, which basically means a very limited set of events you can monitor concurrently. For every counter can monitor one of these events and you can choose which ones are relevant for you. And then um, you can configure the counter to, uh, to trigger an exception when it overflows. So you basically set it to a value and then it counts down and, and it gives you an, event, an exception when it reaches zero or the OS can just dynamically monitor it and uh, ahead of my slides here. And um, then Linux has this OPROF profiling tool, which is basically a user level interface to the PMU, but you can use the PMU directly. And this is an example of what OPROF gives you. So uh, this is um, showing what it counts. In particular, it tells you the actual performance counter used here. So this is CPU clock unhalted. Basically, this is number of cycles the CPU was doing act actual work as opposed to being stalled or being asleep. Um, <clears throat> and then it shows you, again, this uses again a mapping. Basically, whenever this counter um, created an exception, it checked what, what was the instruction pointer, which function is this in, and maps it back towards functions. And you can see that in this case, this is obviously a system level OPROF. 75% uh, was in CC1+, which sounds a lot like is the phase one of the, C of the C++ compiler. And um, it gives you the actual counts, which is 45 something million, 450,000, and 70% of the overall use time, right? So very useful breakdown of where the time goes. And interestingly, you also find the profiler itself popping up here, which is what you expect because it's a program that's running and that's collecting these events and um, writing them out, etc. And this gives you an idea of what is the profiling overhead here. In this case, it's about 3% profiling overhead. So that means, okay, you can't trust the results to more than about this resolution because this is the level at what your profile interferes with the program execution. So this is fairly nice and low and therefore it's all good. So clearly a very useful tool. You can also drill down. So in this case, um, we have a drill down by program. So there's the C++ compiler and the Lynx, that's a web browser. Um, and you see sort of various components. VM Linux, of course, is the Linux kernel. So this is where Linux was operating on behalf of this program. And you so it tells you the system overhead of this program. And this is for a somewhat dated ARM processor the list of actual PMU events you can look at. Your A53 has way more than those. 
Um, these have the advantage to actually fit on one page. <laughs> and it is already pretty informative, right? It tells you a lot you can do here. So iCache misses, fairly obvious. This is awesome, right? The hardware counts how many iCache misses you have in a time window. That's very useful information where if you want to an analyze performance. Dcache miss, instruction buffer store, what does that mean? It means you, you, the CPU is stalled on an instruction fetch. Um, they're presumably somehow related to iCache misses. So. Dcache write back. It's obvious, right? Uh, a dcache line had to be replaced and written back, and the machine is stalled on this write back. Number function calls, very useful. Data dependent stall. What is that one? It's a, a data dependency in the pipeline where a register gets modified by an instruction, and a subsequent instruction is waiting for the rest register value to be known. Um, PC change by software, what funny thing is that? It's a jump, yes. The ARM doesn't have something like an actual jump instruction. You do a jump on ARM by loading an address into the PC count register, or the instruction park. Uh, no, yeah, PC, the program counter. Um, function return, instruction micro TLB miss. Remember, I said that these days we typically have two level TLBs where the le first level is split and the second level un unified like with the uh, CPU caches. So this counts misses here. The main TLB miss, that's the unified TLB. Um, function return mispredict. So function returns are jumps and they, they're, they're predicted by the um, branch predictor unit and you can get miss. Oh, so these are the correct predicts, these are the mispredicts. External data access, don't remember exactly what that was, data micro TOB. Branches executed, very fine grained information. Load store unit store, what is that one? Remember when I talked about caches, write buffers? Right, you, you write and because you don't want to wait until the write makes it back to the next level in the memory hierarchy, you have this FIFO that buffers the write. That's a limited capacity. Eventually, it will fill, and then you, any further writes are stalled. Write buffer drained. This is when the write buffer gets empty. Branches executed, branches predicted, instructions executed. So this is the actual instruction count. And if you divide this one by the cycle counter, you get instructions per cycle, IPC, very important performance measure, etc. Note, of course, these are all counters on the core. There's nothing sort of lower in the uh, memory hierarchy, not on those processes. Other processes have those as well. So you can see that this is extremely uh, useful information if you do a fine-grained performance analysis of some low-level software. And I'll show later towards the end of today um, how you can actually use some of these in a real-life scenario. So this is a true reason which you should have learned any science lab you've ever done, whether at school or uni, that whenever you measure something, you have measurement errors, right? That's just a fact of life. And of course, the standard approach is you repeat the measurements and you um, collect statistics. And so the very minimum you do is the mean and standard deviation. Computer systems are somewhat different because a computer tends to be a highly deterministic system. Uh, it, it's much less deterministic when you talk to the physical world, so the um, devices, etc., in particular networks. But as long as you're just sort of dealing with the CPU and memory, then things are very deterministic. And therefore, it's actually not unusual to have really tiny standard deviations, sometimes even zero. And that gets people. Um, sort of used to not bothering with basic stats and just quoting averages without standard deviation. This is actually really dangerous because it could be that you measure something which doesn't conform to this model. The model is the system is deterministic, therefore we have tiny variance. Um, but sometimes it's not the case and for non-obvious reasons. 
And that's why it's really important to actually always check for the variance. It could indicate a problem, some hidden parameter which you weren't aware of. And I'll give you a really good example later on of, of this happening. Um, so it's really a no-no to just quote um, means without any indication of what the significance is, which is what the standard deviation expresses. In some cases, just enough to say, okay, standard deviations are tiny, like they're less than one unit of the third digit, so 10 to the minus three or so. That, that's typically all you need to know. But until you know that, you don't really know what, how good that data is. So at the very least, show the standard deviation besides the mean. Um, <clears throat> and of course, this means that what, what's, what does the standard deviation mean? Why the bell curve is. Right. So that, that it's a good answer because it, there's actually two things in here, right? The standard deviation assumes there's a bell curve. What's the bell curve? What, what's this, the distribution called? It's normal distribution. So the standard deviation assumes that there's a normal distribution and it gives you the, um, I forgot what this term is called in English. This is from my first year math or school, so I only remember the German term. <laughs> it's where the, the second derivative changes sign. Um, hmm? Infection points, yes, exactly. Um, so the, the standard deviation tells you how far these are away from the mean. And it turns out 68% or something of the distribution is within plus minus one standard deviation. And 95% is within two standard deviations, etc. This is only, all only true for a, for a normal distribution. What's the basic assumption of a normal distribution? Infinite range? You have infinite ranges in computers? Nope. <laughs> What's the other one? Continuous. It's continu continuous variables. Are the things you measure on computers continuous? Nope. <laughs> so strictly speaking, we never deal with a standard with a normal distribution. How come we can apply normal stats usually anyway? Yep, there's what's called the central limit theorem. So typically what we have is binomial uh, distributions. They are distributions over um, discrete variables. And there's a central limit theorem that, which says if the, samples, uh, the number of samples is large enough, it um, approximates a normal distribution. And large enough, you can take as roughly about 30 measurements. So the rule of thumb is if you take at least 30 measurements, then you can treat this essentially as a normal distribution and all your standard stat supplies. We rarely do 30 measurements. Have you ever done 30 measurements of the same variable? Probably not. And sometimes these run for days and, or hours at least, right? And so it's hard to do 30 of them. And typically, it's also completely unnecessary. Of course, you can do sort of equivalent stats on um, binomial distributions. It's much more messy. The math is more involved, etc. But it's usually not necessary because what it means is if you don't have a, stand, a normal distribution, you have a binomial distribution, then the standard deviation or what the thing you compute like the standard deviation doesn't have the same meaning anymore. So it doesn't give you the 68% within plus minus one standard deviation and 95% within plus minus two. But the more samples you have, the more it approximates that. And basically what you say is, okay, normally we say if things are well separated by at least one standard deviation, then they are, we can consider them uh, separate. Or if we're really paranoid, we take three standard deviations, which is the 99 point something. Um, area, right? It just means for the, um, binomial distributions, we have to be much more uh, conservative. So just because things are two standard deviations apart doesn't necessarily mean they're really significantly different. Which, with a normal distribution, they would you could say that with the uh, bina binomial distribution, which means 
much more limited number of samples, you generally can't say that. But very often, as I said earlier, the variance is tiny, so you have a standard deviation that's 10 to the minus 3 or so, and if your two means are 5% apart, then typically that means, yes, they are statistically significantly different. But you need to be careful. So normally, this is a, uh, if your standard deviation is 1.5, then 10.2 is not different from 11.5. There's no statistic significance to this difference in a normal distribution. In the sort of things you have, it may not even be different if your standard deviation is only half that, which on a normal distribution would say oh, there's a statistic significant. So basically, you just have to be more careful with how, how things are separated. But as I said, in most cases, it's a non-issue because your standard deviation is really tiny. <coughs> in general, um, if that's not the case and you want to be sure, you have to run students' t-test, which is more involved. I very rarely had to do that. But the other thing is, as I said earlier, if your standard deviation is not tiny, then you have to be really alert because chances are you're missing something going wrong here. Okay? So this is why it's important to keep that. And so let's do a analysis on a really simple example. This is spec CPU 2000. I run a program. Don't really interesting. I didn't actually say which one it is. <laughs> Lost in time. But this is an actual measurement. Um, so I run the same program 30 times. And these are the execution times I observe. What do we see here? We see some wiggling around here, but the first execution is special, right? After then, it drops right down. What's behind that? Yeah, we warm up the cache, right? Which means that um, important takeaway, you always do some warm-up runs and throw them away before you start the actual measurements to make sure all the caches are in a stable point. And of course, this then becomes a hot cache measurement as opposed to a cold cache measurement. If you wanted to do cold cache measurement, what would you do? Flush the cache in between. Obvious. OK, now what's this wiggling doing out there? This is not a, a tiny standard deviation, right? It's clearly not 10 to the minus 3. Why? What do we see here? We see the clock resolution here, right? You can actually say, well, read out from here what the clock rate is, the, 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 the resolution of the timer. It fluctuates between, this is execution time in seconds, so let's read it in milliseconds. Um, it's milliseconds. So it fluctuates between 44.85 and 44.75. And then there's intermediate values here. Obviously, have a twenty a, a twenty hertz timer resolution there. So these are fifty milliseconds accurate. That's what the timestamps are. And because you have natural fluctuations from whatever noise we get, we have to expect that we are off one or two in average. And this is exactly where this fluctuation comes from. So how do how do did we get there? We have a mental model that if we run a program multiple times, it takes the same amount of time, right? Because it's the same program. And there were some effects that have upset that. The first one was this cache warm-up thing. So we learned from that. We have to warm the cache up to make sure that all the runs are actually comparable, because otherwise this one isn't. And the other thing is, yes, we have a limited resolution to which we measure the time, and that gives us this discrete distribution of um, results. Not a big surprise, but it's something we want to understand, because otherwise, why would time behave like this, right? There needs to be a reason beyond it. 
which comes back to what I said earlier. If you measure something, make sure you actually understand what you're measuring. Because if you don't, chances are you miss something important. So, noisy data, you always have that, and you should always try to minimize the noise. And standard ways to minimize the noise, so what I did was really incompetent benchmarking. I just had a normal system, then my laptop, and run it in a shell. That's not how you time something accurately, right? You normally take better steps to reduce noise, like running in single user mode. Or when you do networking experiments, run on a dedicated network, unless it makes sense to have a um, shared network. If you just want to, exec to time execution time of a program, you should do it in single user mode to get rid of all the background noise which gets produced by all the system services running in the back, etc. Uh, not always possible, so then you have to live with noise. So what happens if you have very noisy data, which happens sometimes? Noise is really big. You get fluctuations of the order of 20% because of noise. How do, you, how do you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, a good start would just have many runs, right? But maybe that's not always, not, not the thing you're after, right? Because, okay, you're noisy, you have a noisy system, and the noise is really a disturbance that detracts from what you're really after. You want to measure the runtime of a program. And just because you you have no choice but running it on a noisy system with all the background activities. That doesn't mean that your natural program execution time fluctuates that much, right? It's just other, other things taking CPU time away from you. So you try to eliminate that. And as I said, one way is to do is um, using single user mode where you minimize this sort of thing. Another one may be to just treat certain results special. So outlier removal is sometimes a valid choice where you take away the, the, the fastest and the slowest value, for example, or you take the floor of the data. And if you're interested in the, the best case performance of a particular program, then taking the floor may make sense. I don't recommend this as a, as a um, general technique. And in fact, it's very dangerous. You have to if you sort of do this um, selection of data, you have to be extremely careful, understand what you're doing, and really document and justify well so that the reader understands what's going on. But sometimes these things have to be done. Just don't do them lightly. So and another thing that's really important for doing good benchmarking is very inputs check outputs. And I had cases where, again, real, I, I don't have any data here. This has got lost in, in, uh, in history. But I remember one of my students doing disk drivers for our microkernel system and measuring performance. And performance was incredibly good. Like, I didn't think this this could produce that throughput. So this is something, okay, I have a mental model that tells me sort of what the result should roughly be. And in this case, they were too good to be true. What could have happened? But basically, this these days, whether it's actually rotating this or solid state devices, so SSDs even more so actually, they're really complex systems, right? They have complete multiprocessors. They have a memory hierarchy. They have AI in there these days. They do lots of processing. In particular, they reorder requests. They actually may deduplicate requests. The disk may actually notice that you're writing zeros all the time and just not bother reading them at all and just um, advancing the pointer or something like that, right? So they, they do a lot of optimization in order to get good average throughput. And of course, that means your benchmark may not actually be doing what you think it is. Um, so just writing the same input data all the time, that basically is asking for trouble. So this is why I say very inputs. And also, um, there was also an example where 
we had amazingly good performance and I thought this couldn't be right and I said to a student actually check what you're reading back and turns out the data wasn't actually hitting the disk and if you reading, read them back then either the performance dropped massively or you got the wrong results back. So it's really important to check that. So varying inputs and this means data as well as addresses. So um, for example if you write blocks to a storage device don't write to the same address all the time right write to, to different addresses don't do everything sequentially unless this is really what you want to optimize for the sequential IO solid uh, storage devices tend to operate much better with uh, sequential access than random access so really think about the access patterns and the data itself so vary both addresses and data and be careful of what optimizations may come in the way. So compilers have a habit of throwing stuff away when they think it's not needed, in particular when the output doesn't depend on it. They do a lot of analysis and find the output doesn't depend on this input, so just throw the whole code away. Um, this do a lot of stuff under the hood, like prefetching and deduplicating and other stuff. Um, so really important to to basically defeat those optimizations but also make sure that what you've written is actually there and you can read it back and do a comparison so this is important for getting ensuring that the integrity of the data um, sometimes it's not possible to compare everything in which case you should at least do um, some tests and yeah so this is actually also an interesting point, right? You shouldn't always hit the same address because that doesn't is not representative of what the system does. Unless you want to optimize for sequential I.O., you shouldn't use sequential addresses. But then randomness means if you use true randomness, then you can get non-reproducible data. In particular, it's very hard to compare two different systems against each other. So typically a good approach is use pseudo-random numbers and seed them with the same value for every um, sequence of experiments on each system, etc., and to, to make sure you got good reproducibility. Okay, now let's look at another concrete example. And again, this is something out of my lab. Um, a student working on energy management and um, got some interesting results. He was running the spec benchmark suite and most of the benchmarks, they, they were completely innocuous, pretty much what you'd expect, got, got some interesting results there, but one was completely behaving weirdly. And so this is a particular benchmark from the spec suite was done you can tell this is a number of years ago because um, used a um, Pentium M laptop I haven't been sold for a long time a fairly dated Linux kernel that dates this experiment roughly and so he did the right thing he ran repeated experiments and collected statistics in particular looked at standard deviations and found okay in most cases standard deviations were tiny as expected except for this one and so we looked at these are execution times for different for repeated runs of the same benchmark on the same system and you can say see that the variance is massive it varies by about execution time of this one benchmark run single user mode on the same Linux system varies by 20% this is stunning right <laughs> it's not what you expect so what the hell is going on here any idea whatever <laughs> So spec, bench, spec, spec CPU, they do just CPU and memory. So they, they don't do I.O. Um, anything gets loaded into memory and then there's some processing and then the results are written out and the writing is not timed. Um, presumably the CPU is loaded fully 
Ooh, that's this, how these things are designed, huh? From the beginning, it's loaded. Yeah. And yet we have this massive fluctuation of execution times. Well, I don't know. How do we find out? So did you say this was running on a laptop? Yeah. Could it be something to do with the heat, like generated by the process, and then the, it like scales, scales the speed down to like around the dead overheating or something? It could do, but you wouldn't see the strong spikes, right? You, you'd probably see a trend rather than sort of this fluctuation, but good thinking. What do you do? In a Maybe, I don't know. What do you do in a case like this? Profile. Profile, yes. What do you do? How do you profile it? You use the system developer's best friend, which is the PMU. And that's what we did. And I really kicked myself in the end because I should have known where this must be coming from. But so we used to, he ran profile with uh, the performance counters. And all the performance counters were completely innocuous, with one exception which is L2 misses, so it is cache misses. And of course, I adjusted the scaling, so the curves, you, you can show that the, the curves have the same structure. But basically what you can tell here is that L2 misses completely explain the result. When there's lots of L2 misses, the thing is slow, etc. So, and you can actually, from this data, you can read out the memory latency of that system because you can you just ex, uh, divide the the ratio of execution times by the number of misses and you get the the miss latency and you can see this is the the misses so this system executes sometimes with zero l2 misses and sometimes with 400 million over a runtime of 200 seconds so that's um, two million L2 misses per second. And as I said, you can actually read out the um, memory latency as being 123 nanoseconds. And if you subtract that, you get a pretty flat curve, which is sort of what you expected in the first case. So really, L2 misses explain everything here. Why would the L2 misses fluctuate so much? Thinking of the four C's of cache misses, what are they? Okay, what are the four C's? It's compulsory. Compulsory. <laughs> Capacity. <laughs> Conflict. And coherence, which is you only get from multicore, which we don't do here. Okay, are these going to be um, compulsory misses? No. Why not? The compulsory misses would be the same for every iteration, right? every execution. Okay, we can exclude compulsory misses. Are they capacity misses? I mean, but at the start, it's not doing them, so... Sometimes it's not doing them, so the cache capacity is enough, right? They're not capacity misses. So what are they? There's only one left. They're conflict misses. Okay, why do we get this huge difference in the number of conflict misses of the same program executing multiple times on this back to back on the same machine. Seems bizarre. What happens? Obviously, so, some one parameter at least changes between those ex the executions. So this is a typical case of a hidden parameter, right? There's a parameter in the system that determines your execution time, which you haven't thought of. What is it? So one thing to look at is we're talking L2 misses. How is the L2 accessed? By physical addresses. By physical addresses, yes. Okay, so something changes with physical addresses here. What would cause this vast difference in conflict misses of the physically addressed cache between different runs? Yes, obviously. There's different, the program runs with different, out of different parts of physical memory each time. 
and sometimes it's lucky. This is obviously the cache has a limited um, associativity. This is obviously a memory intensive program, otherwise it would never produce as many cache misses. And uh, sometimes the physical memory layout is associativity friendly and other times it maximizes collisions, right? So it's an artifact of how Linux hands out physical memory to this thing. So what's behind this? Linux is randomizing physical memory allocation. Why does it do that? It was actually a new feature that had just been introduced before this. <laughs> it's actually not security. Ad um, address space layout randomization would use virtual addresses because this is what you use for attacks, right? Um, presumably, to it does that to um, reduce cache conflicts by avoiding um, systematic patterns in cache layout. Turns out in this particular benchmark, sometimes it gets really pathological. In most cases, that's probably a good strategy to randomize your physical page allocation to basically equalize the load on the cache. But in this case, sometimes it leads to a really bad situation. So, What's the takeaway from this? In case I haven't said it before, you need a mental model of your system and you need to check that the system conforms to your mental model. In this case, the mental model was repeated execution, model or some warm up in the beginning of the same program back to back on the system should reduce the same runtime and it didn't. And the student did the right thing. He, he did, he checked his standard deviations and found there's something really odd with this particular benchmark. And we could confirm that. How did we do that? We ran repeatedly, but rebooting the system each time. So each time boot up from zero and then run the thing and the fluctuations were way reduced. Okay, so this is really a core thing you always have to keep in mind. Make sure you've got a model, you know what to expect from your benchmark and be alert to when something don't behave to expectations and then dig, dig deeper. A few other things, vary only one parameter at a time. This should go without saying, but it's amazing how many people violate this. I see that particularly often as student thesis, they compare two things and vary three, three parameters at a time, compare the system, don't understand what's going on. Not surprising, I wouldn't either, right? very one thing at the time when you do evaluations. Obviously, good bookkeeping is really important so you can reproduce something uh, when something went wrong. Um, measure directly as possible. Avoid pathological data and this is easier said than done. So depending on what you do, random may be really pathological. Sometimes sequential is really pathological. What's a good case for sequential giving, sequential access giving really poor results? Doesn't necessarily have to be across page boundaries, but what's, what's the important point where sequential gives really bad results? Sequential works really bad if you have a working set exceeding the size of your cache and whether the cache is your physical memory or the TLB or, or the CPU cache, doesn't matter, or some sort of caching is involved. Your working set is bigger than the cache and um, the cache uses least recently used replacement, right? That's the, the worst thing where every new block you get a, um, um, a miss and you basically prefetch all for nothing. Usually, power of two sizes are good. Sometimes they can be really pathological. For example, if everything is allocated at power of two boundaries, what bad effects could you get? If this happens to be the cache line size, you could just, um, Usually that's good, but sometimes this could uh, maximize your conflict misses, particularly if it's the color size or the cache stride. And 
one-off powers of two may or may not be good. Basically, you need to think about what you're doing. And um, if something behaves strangely, just vary some of these parameters, see the effect, and then you may learn something from that. Um, so because it's, it's very circumstance specific. OK, and then just in case I haven't said this before, use a model. Have a hypothesis of you, how your system is operating and make sure that you, your benchmarking checks that hypothesis. And if it supports it, that's good. If it doesn't, drill down and understand what is, where, where you're wrong. Where, somehow that means your hypothesis is not, wrong, not right or there's an implementation bug in the system. Well, it's a mismatch between hypothesis and the system, obviously, and you need to understand where this is coming from. Um, yeah, you just have to worry about a lot of stuff. So check that it behaves according to the model. OK, another example, memory cop. Let's see what the hypothesis is. I do a mem copy. I benchmark a mem copy and measure execution time as a um, function of buffer size. What do you expect? OK, our hypothesis is a straight line. Because the more data we copy, the longer it should take, right? And it should be proportional. This is what I get. It's not quite a straight line. And it's much easier to see if we look at the throughput, which is the derivative of the, of the um, execution time. Right? And we get this funny curve here, the green one. What do we see here? This is not our hypothesis, right? The straight line would mean the green line is level. So wh what hidden parameters did our hypothesis not include? Well, we, we're not really warming up in the sense that we, we, we time, assume this is cold cache results. It doesn't actually matter much. Okay. So there's, there's, there's three specific areas, right? This is wiggle here at the beginning, where we have really high throughput and increasing, and then it drops. And then we have these two steps here. Let's look at those two steps. Where would they come from? The first is about 200, let's say 256 kilobytes, because it's almost certainly a power of two. And the other is at about 512. Well, it starts there and it ends there. And well, there's actually this drop off here, which is at, say, 64 kilobytes. What would those correspond to? Yeah. So let's assume this one is probably 32 kilobyte dropping, and the drop goes to 64. And this is 256 kilobytes starting the drop, and it ends at 512. It's copying stuff, right? It loads it into the cache and then sends it back to memory. Copying means you load it into the CPU, so it makes its way up the cache hierarchy, and then it makes its way down the cache hierarchy again. So would the first one be the L1 cache, which happens to be 32 kilobyte, in the, which is easy to guess here, because that's where the drop starts, and it ends at twice that. Why twice? Because things get to two memory location. It's copied from one and sent to the other. So the data is twice in the cache, basically, or at least um, the cache is accessed twice. Well, it will actually be twice in the cache. And the second one is presumably the L2, right? Which happened to be a megabyte here. Not sure why this is here and not one I didn't investigate further. But we basically see the cache hierarchy here, OK? And the first one, where it's going up, throughput increasing with buffer size. Well, huh? 
Pipelining is one good reason because the pipeline is becomes more effective if you have um, a longer length of the loop, right? And what's the other effect? So, I mean, this is a simple loop. You read data from dereferencing one point and write it by dereferencing another pointer and add in a tight loop. So yes, pipelining is going to increase efficiency for a while. And the other thing, it's going to be loop overhead, which is maximum with if you just copy a single byte and then get gets amortized if you copy a bigger buffer. And that explains this curve, right? So this is again, this amazing what you can read out of the some thim simple performance um, and evaluations if you do them properly. So if you see a result like that, don't just discard it. Make sure you understand it, because otherwise it might bite you. And so, OK, you get this loop overhead. You try to get rid of it. Standard way is you, you run stuff in a loop um, to get rid of both the timer overhead and the loop overhead. So the loop overhead you get rid by, you say, if you want to time the system call by doing many of them back to back. And the timer on some architectures, particularly x86, can be quite costly. Um, so there's a significant cost to that one. You can subtract that by doing an empty loop body. And um, that should get that should eliminate both timer and the loop overhead. And of course, you need to be careful that the compiler doesn't optimize this away, which it inevitably will if you do this with compiler optimization enabled. So this stop code, you better compile with optimizations disabled, otherwise you get funny results. Which makes sense because that's not what you want to time. You want to time the system call here, right? So that, that stuff is optimized. But you, your scaffolding um, code, you generally want to run without optimization. And then we have one great example. This is the example that got my me started with this benchmarking crimes list. So this was when I was um, at my startup, Open Kernel Labs, and the competition published this paper. This is actually a published paper. You can find it in, um, in the digital library. They had a competitor system, which we knew was way slower than ours, because that's what the, um, our customers found when they compared performance. And so they claimed they had way better performance than us. And in this paper, they showed this graph. This is the only thing that's in there. And um, you can check yourself. There's no further explanation than what I say here. So there's, this figure doesn't even have a capture. It doesn't have any more explanation except, so this is a radar plot using a bunch of micro benchmarks. These are all, I think, all LM bench benchmarks. So Linux micro benchmarks is measures a virtualized system on their kernel as well as an ours. Normalized to blue, which is this. And this is latency, so big is bad. And L4 is way out, right? And so the only explanation is, OK, L4 is a factor 2 to 20 slower. And they don't give zero information how they measured it. They don't give the absolute values, so I can't tell whether those numbers make sense or not, except that I knew they wouldn't. And um, what do you do there, right? This is just really crap science producing numbers like that with without there's no chance to re reproduce those and um, I'm pretty sure what they did was just taking our open source distribution their system wasn't open source either so we couldn't we had no chance to reproduce this ours was open source I assume they just took the standard the default configuration which has all debugging and profiling disabled and of course profiling produces a lot of data that slows down execution that would easily explain that um, really, but basically really pathological science I had a lot of fun writing a series of blogs, shaming them uh, about their incompetence. And then I started my benchmarking crimes list, which is now pretty known in the community. And people actually refer to it and call for papers for conferences. Uh, so it had some benefit. There's another example of bad benchmarking. So this is, again, a published from a published paper, uh, a database system. And what they're looking at is scalability of the database system on a multi-core. 
So they vary the applied load. So this may basically means the um, transaction, the number of concurrent transactions, and measure throughput. And so we get this curve that looks roughly straight. Is this good scalability? It looks fine, right? It scales linear. Okay. Does it help you if I tell you that this is on a 32 core system and you look up to a concurrency of 32? Hey? Any comments? It seems probably not too hard to scale when you have less load than CPUs, right? <laughs> so, a postdoc of mine looked at this a bit further. This is, this is the same setup, but just <laughs> So, the typical performance cliff, right? This is actually totally broken scalability. But it looks nice here. I never revealed whose paper that was because it's actually a fairly famous person. Um, but this is, that's a, a real benchmarking crime. And I can't believe they did that. So, like anywhere in science, benchmarking need to be done ethical. Ethics is extremely important for integrity of science. And so you really need to be careful about what you do. In particular, it's inherent that we compare to a prior work, right? Com take the technical competitor in some sense. If you're in a company, then it may be a real competitor. If you're a researcher, then at least is the competing researchers. And so you have to compare to, to prior work. And sometimes you just compare to published data, and sometimes you rerun it yourself. And you just need to be sure that you're totally fair to in the way you compare your system. For example, the prior work may be optimized for something completely different. And then, okay, say this is a, um, optimized for large scales, uh, large number of CPU scalability, whereas we are in, into embedded system performance and particularly optimized for energy. And of course, that's a different trade-off, right? And so just because our system behaves better than this one, that doesn't mean you should dump on the, co on the other people and saying they did crap work. Just put things into context, state exactly what you're doing and why and how this is comparable or not. And it's even more important if you have to benchmark the other people's system themselves. So it's really important to be fair about competitors in a general sense or really comparison to prior work. And uh, there's other p ways of cheating with benchmarks. This one has been long practiced in the compiler community, compiler writers. The standard benchmarks around, so compiler writers would, and this was particularly before the most compilers were open source, they would recognize the benchmarks and then put specific optimizations for those benchmarks. Basically, emit handcrafted code for these benchmarks to make themselves look good. And, um, Samsung deserves the honor for pioneering this form of cheating in the hardware space, where a number of years ago, they had phones which would recognize a standard phone performance benchmark and put the processor in an undocumented high clock rate, which you couldn't access in any other way to get particularly good benchmark result. This is particularly nasty. Some people simulate benchmark, benchmark simulated systems. That's almost always garbage in, garbage out because in a simulation, you don't have the actual system. You have a model of the system. The model makes certain assumptions and you basically can only test within those assumptions. Amazing, but I've seen that too. Um, I, this was a student of mine who wrote a distributed hypervisor on Itanium and there was a company selling something like that and they did a, they published a benchmark which I, I, we didn't even have the idea of doing something as stupid as that. They just ran multiple copies on spec, one per um, CPU and showed scalability. Like spec is a single processor benchmark running multiple of them. Of course it should scale uh, perfectly. Fact that this didn't scale perfectly was actually showing that they had some real issues. I've seen this one as well <laughs> in a recent paper actually. 
people do some networking work and measure evaluation evaluated by running CPU insensitive benchmarks. <laughs> it's complete bullshit, right? So honestly, I've seen all of that. So last five or so minutes, established performance limits. So this, this is the really ideal way of evaluating something. If you can get a theoretical baseline, like an optimal case, um, sometimes possible, or look at the hardware performance limits. For example, when we look at IPC, um, how do we know 300 cycles IPC is good? Well, if you know that just to trap in the hardware and do a context switch is 200 cycles, then it's probably simply good. So establishing hardware limits like that is a good idea. Okay, now to the real world example. Um, again, this is from my time at Open Kernel Labs, where we evaluate, where we virtualized the Symbian phone OS. Remember, anyone remember Symbian? That was the thing, anyone remember Nokia? <laughs> so Nokia phones um, and Ericsson phones there has Symbian. This was a UK company that had a, an operating system especially for phones. It's been completely wiped out by Android. And the, but in those days it was a, a mainstream phone operating system. And so we had this hypervisor and evaluated performance of Linux on OKL4 as well as in this case Symbian. And so this is uh, the bottom line, micro benchmark, null system call overhead, which normally is a senseless benchmark, but for a virtualized system, it actually means something because remember how virtualization works in order to get into the kernel, we need to do the context switch stuff, right? IPC four and back. Um, and so this basically measures the baseline hypervisor overhead. And so that, the native system was a quarter microsecond for the null system benchmark, for null syscall, and the virtualized system was 0.8 microseconds, so about two and a, uh, th three and a bit times slower. Question is, is this a good result or a bad one? And how can you tell? How can you tell, like, what do you expect? Remember going back when I yesterday talked about virtualization overhead, when you do trap and emulate uh, virtualization or para virtualization as in this case. So instead of having the two mode switches getting in out of kernel, you have four mode switches and two context switches, right? So we have an additional two mode switches and two context switches. So the question is, two mode switches only, two mode switches and two context switches. So we basically mo expect more than double the cost, right? So the ballpark is probably not that far away. So let's drill down further. In order to do that, we need to see what, what's the platform. So this was an ARM 11 processor. Um, and if we convert this to the cycles, which is usually the good thing, is then we say, okay, native was 93 cycles versus just under 300 cycles, so 200 cycles overhead. And um, a cache miss penalty on the system was 20 cycles. So this corresponds to about 10 cache misses, which is not that bad, right? 10 cache misses you get very quickly. But of course, these are, these are cold ca uh, hot cache benchmarks. They run in a tight loop, so there shouldn't really be many cache misses. Um, I said this before, so what do you do? How do you find out? How do you drill down and see whether this makes sense or not? What tool do you use? You use the PMU. So these are PMU results of this. So we looked at various um, PMU events and these are all the interesting ones. So most of these are pretty much the same. There's one more iCache miss that turned out to be a conflict miss, which was a result of a particular optimization that penalized this particular case, but was beneficial for more complex system calls. And the real difference are 
D stall cycles, I stall cycles, and uh, so this is basically memory latency, and increased number of instructions. So 125, 95 extra instructions. Is this good or bad? Or put it in context, right? These are, this overhead corresponds to two, two system calls that include a full context switch. So Symbian takes 30 cycles to do nothing, trap it, so 30 instructions to do nothing. I don't know what they do. 30 instructions for null system call seems slightly excessive, right? Whereas um, L4 does 45, 2 times 45 instructions for actually doing something, namely a complete context switch. That doesn't seem too bad, right? This is sort of in the expected range. You basically have three cache misses, right? Remember the, the cache miss latency was about 20 cycles. So three cache misses, doesn't sound too bad, and it turns out we could trace those to, to this particular implementation trick. So it turns out this is actually a good result. Okay, so some more. This is part of Symbian's equivalent to LM Bench. They are sort of operating system micro benchmark suite. So they measure things like context switch, latency, file create and close, and threat suspend cost. And we get some numbers out there. And obviously, the latencies are higher in the virtualized system, not surprising. Do they make sense? Are they good or bad? Fact is, you can't tell. This is a poor representation, right? So the first thing we do, oops, wrong way. First thing we do is improve the representation, express everything in microseconds. So some of these are already microseconds, others are the inverse, so we invert them back. And then we see the difference is, okay, 0.62 microseconds. Remember the overhead of the null system call was um, 0.8 microseconds. This is less than that. So this is just expected virtualization overhead, right? We don't even need to look at this any further. Um, similar here, this is a micro, 0.8 microsecond virtualization overhead. This is a bit higher. Does that make sense? Well, let's um, put the overheads in the appropriate units, looking at this difference in cycles. Um, oh, I confused cycles and microseconds, sorry. Divide them by the number of system calls made, and then we end up here. This is the real number to look up. 230 cycles per system call. Um, 200 cycles, no, no, I was looking at these all microseconds, 0.8 microsecond was the overhead, or 199 cycles. Right? So we are in the right ballpark here. So this is a good result. Same for this one, right ballpark, good result. This one looks a bit high. Further investigation shows Symbian, this en enables interrupts. Remember what I yesterday said about interrupt enabling, disabling, how this happens a lot for um, implementing mutual exclusion, which is exactly what they did here. So presumably we could have improved that by doing the trick I talked about yesterday for self-virtualization. We didn't do it, so this caused a lot of traps into the hypervisor. All up, when I saw these results, I was really happy. I thought, okay, this is about as fast as it gets. And then the final one. This is again, you have similar things in LM Bench. These are basically exercising floating point operations. So a whole buffer of floating point numbers doing things like um, conversions and whatever operations on them. And we get overheads and they are about a quarter percent. Which is a bit weird because these are purely user level programs. There's no system calls. So why would we see any virtualization overheads here? Not time in the system call, but it's the, the, the timer interrupt. This is a, it's a time slice system, right? The timer interrupt, of course, gets delivered to the hypervisor. It needs to be re-injected into the guest as a virtual interrupt, and of course, that invokes the hypervisor. So this is where we get some virtualization overhead from. And if we then look at, okay, how does that compare to 
the timer ticks. Turned out this had a hundred, a one kilohertz timer. It's 2.7 seconds per timer tick. Remember the basic virtualization overhead was about um, 0.8 microseconds. This is a bit higher, but the 0.8 microseconds was a hot cache number because it was run in a tight loop. This is a cold cache number. We run a lots of user level code and every now and then we get a timer tick. And of course the, the hypervisor finds a cold cache and so you expect those higher. So this is actually a good, good result. It's about as good as it gets. Okay, so to wrap up, make sure that you have stable results, monitor your standard deviations, really drill down if something doesn't behave according to your model, always have a model, and um, use the tools you've got. And my complete list of benchmarking crimes is here if you're interested, and it's got some discussion.